way mm -hmm. back when. Um, I read a lot of translations of 18th, 19th, 20th century literature, both in, in Russian, of course, in English, but then also in German, which was my, my native language. And at that time, in the 70s and 80s, there, was quite a, there were quite a few uh, scholars who believed that in many cases, German was more, uh, had certain similarities in tonality, in, in structure that lent themselves better to translations of Russian than English did. Mm. And I was wondering if with Japanese, which is a, a different uh, language group completely, you had found anything similar? Yeah, I don't, you know, I, I wonder if it's, so there's a linguistic issue perhaps, but then there's also the issue of how you, uh, or how people in general react to translations, right? And also, say, maybe the relationship of different languages in terms of, um, say, J Japanese is not as widely spoken as English. So if you translate from English into Japanese, and this has been the case for a long time, right? Japan, for the past, um, since 1868 has been, well, 1853, say, has been very, very aware that there are other languages out there and other people speaking and writing in other languages and that the people out there have a lot of money and a lot of power and so on, right? So that, that created a kind of, early on, certainly by the 1880s, created a kind of culture, maybe it's a, I don't speak German so I don't really know, but maybe similar in some ways to, to what one hears about a kind of permissive and open, um, openness to experimentation in German translation. Um, you have a situation like that very, very much in Japan and it continues to this day. Um, with Japanese and Thomas Pynchon in particular, I'm re I mean, the translation I'm doing is by one of the great, you know, he's a, a translator who um, turns everything he translates into a bestseller. And he doesn't translate bestsellers. He translates sometimes books that are completely obscure in the US, but he's so famous as a translator He's in fact, in fact, been cited with Murakami mean, Haruki as one of the most influential writers um, in Japan today by a number of, of, of incoming writers. But anyway, with, um, his translation is great. Um, and he's exploiting the fact that Japanese uses graphs, Sino-Japanese characters, they're sometimes called, and then has two syllabaries. And you can do something very neat in Japanese, which is to take, um, you can write something in characters and then put on a gloss, basically telling you how to read it. And the gloss and the characters don't necessarily have to match. If you imagine in English having a word and then a parenthesis with the, um, the phonetic spelling, you know, the phonetic spellings that you see in Webster's and so on, not of that word, but of a different word, right? Telling you that this word should be pronounced, say the word um, translation should be pronounced as, oh well, or something like that. <laughs> You can do that in Japanese very easily, and he does that, and it's just brilliant. And I kind of think, I, maybe this is going back on what I said earlier, but if only Thomas Pynchon could write in Japanese, <laughs> what fun he would have. Mary, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say, well, first of all, I, I kind of believe, Michael, that some of them, I, I think you were saying this, that some of them are just great translators, and, and they overcome whatever the obstacles of the language are. I, I kind of find, uh, particularly when I, maybe not so much in published translations, but I find that when languages are superficially close and similar, that you that the translators uh, don't look deeply enough and they end up taking kind of easy easy ways out and that sometimes it's a trap, like English English Spanish translation Spanish English translation. For example, I mean I don't want to go on too long about this, but um, one of the problems you get when you have a Romance language that looks so much like English, that has parts of speech that are, have the same names as parts of speech in English, is that you find a, you find a, a very Latinate vocabulary. And you don't get Anglo-Saxon roots, you don't get Germanic roots, you don't get other, other, an, a broad vocabulary, which is absolutely crucial to a good English translation. And so that sometimes that similarity, that, that kind of superficial grammatical similarity is a, is, is a, is a terrible, terribly misleading and, and leads to, to weak, I would say, translations. But I think it's more a matter of good translators, personally. Anyone else? Uh, I want to know about Shirley Jackson you mentioned. Uh, 
and since my job involves somewhat a research of the literary past and history of the area, is this the Shirley Jackson who taught at Syracuse University and lived in Rochester? And uh, uh, I the think so. Week. She lived in, didn't she live in Connecticut somewhere? Uh, like a small town? Uh, she was writing in the, in the like 1940s. Yeah. She died um, 50, 60, right? And she was scandalous at Syracuse University. Oh, no, 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 this no, one I don't know. Yeah, 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 I was just reading about oh, her, no. too. Oh, okay. yeah, this is a different no. Okay. <laughs> I want to hear about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is for Mr. Merch. Um, Sinara Gangsters was a really cool read. If you could translate anything else by him, would you? If someone. Because it said in like the, the flap that he wrote. It's written a lot of books. Yeah. Um, are they any good? Are they worth translating? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the history of Japanese he has, literature. He has a book called uh, Japanese Nihongun Gakuseisuishi, which is um, the rise and fall of Japanese literature, which is a translation, I mean, sorry, not a translation, it is a history of Japanese literature, sort of, but it's also a novel. Um, and it mixes up things that were happening in the 1880s with things that were happening a week ago, and uh, it's really brilliant. I mean, he's he's one of my favorite writers, and in Japan, you know, he's one of the, the lions of contemporary literature, um, one of the founding fathers of contemporary literature, contemporary Japanese literature, maybe. Um, and nobody knows him in the U.S., right? Um, except for that book. So, well, Sayonara <laughs> Rick Gangster's okay. I did, it showed up actually on the best ten lists of several uh, newspapers that year, so a certain number of people did pay attention to that book. Um, but it was published by a very small publisher that only does Japanese literature. Um, and I think if they could, they might possibly be interested in doing another book of his. Um, possibly, but you know, it doesn't sell. It's not going to make them any money. Um, it's just interesting because you say he's so popular and important in to, Japan. to Japanese literature that there would be some interest in America. You'd think there would, uh, <laughs> but there isn't. No. And that's, I mean, it's kind of... Yeah, and it's very interesting because, you know, you were saying earlier that with Russian authors, they'll say, well, isn't there something older? You know, <laughs> why, why must you always bring us these projects with these young writers? With Japan, of course, it's, isn't there another Murakami Haruki? Is, or Haruki Murakami? Um, you know, can't you give us the next big thing? Um, and yet, nobody's willing to take the gamble. So it's a very, you're caught in a kind of very depressing bind. So you can reread Sainer. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? Well, thank you all for coming. There's some refreshments outside the door. And thank all of you for wonderful.